Welcome back to the playlist on heme synthesis. This should be a fairly short video. We're going to talk about ferrochelatase in this video. This is the terminal enzyme in heme B synthesis. So heme B is going to ultimately be this molecule over here. So this molecule right here, this is heme B. And we're basically going to do a very simple mechanism to get that ultimately from this guy over here, which is protoporphyrin 9. So ultimately, the net reaction of ferrochelatase is protoporphyrin 9, we take away two protons, insert ferrous iron, and we get heme B. Okay? Now, just sort of kind of uh, delving into the name, uh, the ferro in the name, the ferro is derived from the fact that this mechanism involves iron. In fact, what we're doing is we're putting the ferrous iron into the uh, porphyrin ring system to be chelated in there. And the last part of the name, chelatase, means it's an enzyme that basically causes chelation of iron by some molecule. In most cases, these are gonna be uh, porphyrins or corins. Um, for example, there's another enzyme called magnesium chelatase that would ordinarily take protoporphyrin 9 and put a magnesium in the center and that actually leads to chlorophyll synthesis we'll have a whole playlist on that one day and also there's a cobalt chelatase and that's used in vitamin b12 synthesis and it chelates a cobalt in the center of the corin ring okay so chelatases just cause Lewis bases to basically chelate or hold in some kind of metal ion, and it doesn't have to be iron. It just turns out that in this case it is. Okay, So we're going to take protoporphyrin 9, put an iron in the center, and then we'll have we'll have heme B. Okay, If we want to make other types of heme, we'll have to do processing from heme B, but we're not doing that in this video. Okay, So some things to know about ferrochelatase is number one there's a very critical histidine residue in the active site so this guy right here this is the critical histidine residue this is going to be what does all the initial proton transfers to get those protons out of the center of the porphyrin ring also of really interesting note a very particular interest in the active site is this guy right here this is what we call and let me write this down here this is called a two iron a two iron two sulfur center okay this is a cofactor that exists in some enzymes okay the two iron is derived from the fact that there are these two irons right here and they're key each one is chelated by two cysteine residues within the protein and then you also have these two sulfides that are chelated in here between the irons okay so basically each one of those irons has four sulfurs attached to it two of the sulfurs come from cysteine thiolates the others come from free sulfides so actually sulfide unusual as it may be there are sulfides in humans in fact this is one of the enzymes that has sulfide in fact all enzymes and proteins that have iron sulfur centers have these okay now the iron sulfur center in ferrochelatase does not play a direct role in catalysis. And this is something they figured out through different studies. Um, the mammalian ferrochelatase has this iron sulfur center. But if you go to more primitive types of cells like prokaryotes, they don't have this iron sulfur center. So there have been many theories out there as to what the purpose of this iron sulfur center is. Um, for a time, they used to think it was actually part of the catalysis, but that has since been disproven. Uh, this iron sulfur center plays no role in catalysis. Um, these irons, as far as anybody knows, are not the irons that get put into the porphyrin ring system. So this iron sulfur center really is not involved in the catalysis. So the question is, what is it for? Well, for that, we have to discuss the regulation of this enzyme. Okay, This is not an allosteric enzyme. Okay but it is regulated based on iron. So before we get into the actual direct regulation of ferrochelatase, I want to talk about another enzyme that has an iron sulfur center called aconitase. And we've touched on aconitase in some other videos. This is also called aconitate hydratase. This is the second enzyme in the TCA cycle. It's the one that comes directly after citrate synthase. But aconitase actually, in times when there's low iron, 
So when there's low iron in the cell, what this guy does is it jettisons its iron sulfur center. So it removes the iron sulfur center from it. And so when it removes the iron sulfur center, it becomes what we call an iron response protein. Okay, so aconitase, what it can do is it can activate genes that are involved in ferritin and transferrin synthesis. So it turns out when there's low iron, what ends up happening is you lower the amount of ferritin that's produced. If you want to know more about ferritin, go watch the video on iron transport. Basically what ferritin is, is it, it's what holds on to iron and prevents it from getting into the peripheral cells. Okay, so it holds on to, to iron. Well, if you have low iron in your system, you don't want to make that ferritin because you actually want that iron to get to your peripheral cells. So it downregulates ferritin whenever aconitase becomes an iron response protein. But the other thing that it does is it upregulates transferrin. And transferrin is a protein in the blood that moves iron to and from different places. Initially, it'll move it from the digestive tract, where the, and specifically the duodenum, where most of the iron absorption takes place, and it will transport it to various tissues. Okay, so having said that, um, what this ultimately seeks to do is when you have low iron, all this stuff happens in an attempt to increase the amount of iron. So that's ultimately what you want. This is a type of negative feedback. If you have low iron, aconitase jettisons its iron sulfur center, becomes an iron response protein, downregulates ferritin, upregulates transferrin, and that ultimately leads to an increase in iron in the periphery. Okay, so that's critical to understand. Now what we have to assume is what happens if there's no iron. Let's say there's low iron, some kind of iron deficiency. So this is before we get the increased iron. So we're assuming we have low iron. Well, if you have low iron, number one, you don't need to be running this enzyme. So it turns out that there's two ways lack of iron uh, doesn't allow this enzyme to work. Okay, number one, first of all, obviously this enzyme needs iron as its substrate. Iron 2 plus, iron in the ferrous state, that's its substrate. But if there's low iron around, remember that iron is also used in the iron sulfur center. So if there's not a lot of iron, there's also not going to be a lot of heme synthesis. Because it turns out that even though the iron sulfur center plays no direct role in catalysis, it's pretty much absolutely required for the function of ferrochelatase. So if there's no iron, there's not really going to be an iron sulfur center there, and so the enzyme won't work. And then what will end up happening is the protoporphyrin 9, this protoporphyrin 9 that's shown up here, this guy, okay, he can go back and allosterically inhibit delta amino levulinic acid synthase, or ALA synthase, and that shuts down this whole pathway, okay? So when there's no iron around, okay, the iron sulfur center here gets jettisoned, okay, because there's little iron, okay, and then what happens is you start building up protoporphyrin 9, and then the protoporphyrin 9 can go back and allosterically inhibit ALA synthase, okay, so that's something that's critical to understand. If you don't have enough iron, you're not going to be making heme. And part of it is the fact that there won't be very good iron sulfur centers in ferrochelatase, but also you're going to be building up protoporphyrin 9, and that will allosterically inhibit delta amino levolytic acid synthase. Okay? Some other things about this enzyme structurally. Um, first of all, the, the gene that codes for it is actually a nuclear gene. So even though this enzyme exists in the inner mitochondrial membrane and catalyzes in the mitochondrial matrix, the gene that codes for it is coded for by nuclear DNA. So what has to happen is, obviously, RNA polymerase has to transcribe that gene. And then, obviously, the mRNA leaves the nucleus. And what you end up doing is you synthesize preferrochelatase. Okay? Preferrochelatase is a protein made by the ribosome in the cytosol that ultimately has... Um, it has an extra protein sequence on it. And that protein sequence helps it get directed into the mitochondria and then ultimately into the inner mitochondrial membrane, in which case at that point it will have already lost that protein chain. And then you get basically the complete ferrochelatase that's now ready to catalyze the reaction. Okay.
If you were to have a deficiency of this enzyme, it would be termed erythropoietic protoporphyria. Okay, as we know, whenever you have deficiencies of enzymes in heme synthesis, you call those porphyria. So this particular deficiency, if you're deficient in ferrochelatase, I'm going to spell this out. It's kind of a long word. Erythro erythropoietic protoporphyria. So this is erythropoietic protoporphyria. That's a deficiency of ferrochelatase. Um, and ultimately, what it will mean for the cell is less heme synthesis, okay? Now, there is one other way that this enzyme can be regulated, and it's through nitric oxide, okay? And basically, the idea behind nitric oxide is it's released during respiratory burst. And ordinarily, when you're doing respiratory burst, you're directing that particular uh, synthesis of free radicals and release of them at some kind of bacterial cell because apparently the bacterial cell is where it doesn't need to be and you've got to kill it and free radicals accomplish this well nitric oxide is a free radical of course it's synthesized by nitric oxide synthase in this case it's inducible nitric oxide synthase the one made by white blood cells and that nitric oxide is a free radical okay now, this nitric oxide has the capacity to enter into this iron sulfur center of ferrochelatase. And when it does that, it disrupts the structure of the iron sulfur center and kills it. And so it turns out that when nitric oxide does this and kills the iron sulfur center, it actually completely kills the activity of the whole enzyme. And so what this does is, is in the vicinity of the bacteria, if you have respiratory burst it basically ensures that heme isn't made because if you think about a strategy for getting rid of the, getting rid of the bacteria you'd like them to not be able to use the heme that's made by the host right because you have to realize that bacteria have similar enzymes to us they have enzymes in the electron transport chain like cytochrome c oxidase that use heme uh, certainly they have cytochrome c which also uses heme so you got to get the bacteria unable to use what you're making. So you release the nitric oxide, it gets into this iron sulfur center, kills the iron sulfur center, kills the enzyme, and so now you're not making heme momentarily, enough to a point to where it's not helping the bacteria at all. So I hope that made a little bit of sense. It's just a strategy that white blood cells, along with ferrochelatase, use to prevent growth of bacteria. Okay, so enough on that. Let's actually go into the rather simple mechanism of ferrochelatase. Now, mind you, this is a proposed mechanism. It's not completely understood, but there is kind of a common consensus that this is, is in fact what happens. So like I mentioned earlier, there is a critical histidine residue in the active site. If you mutate this, um, this residue, you've got a serious problem because these protons that are here on the nitrogens in the porphyrin ring system, they won't be able to be removed. These hydrogens have to be removed for the iron to be chelated there in the center. So what this shift base of the histidine is going to do is it's going to deprotonate these nitrogens, okay? And just keep in mind that, you know, when I draw this structure over here on the right, this is, of course, one resonance contributor. Okay, there's many resonance contributors you can, you know, you can draw. I'm just showing you one of them that places the negative charge on this particular nitrogen, but you can draw countless other ones, and we're not going to go into that. Just understand that the porphyrin ring system, even in this form, is still highly aromatic. Okay, and so what you generate through that mechanistic step is this histidine that's now protonated. And so what's going to happen is this enzyme is going to act like a proton pump. So these protons are going to be transferred through a series of basic residues and it will dump the protons out of the enzyme and basically out of the porphyrin rings way. So there's going to be some base here in the active site that's going to re um, abstract the proton from the histidine, regenerating the resting state of histidine, and now you're ready to um, deprotonate the last nitrogen of the porphyrin ring system okay so that's exactly what's going to happen again so we're going to do the exact same mechanism except we're doing it on the other nitrogen so this guy's going to come in here and we're going to have a proton transfer 
and you're going to get exactly what you got in the first mechanistic step. So now what you have is you have a completely deprotonated porphyrin ring system. The only thing that needs to be added here is the ferrous iron. Now just remember that I can draw many, many, many resonance contributors for this particular molecule. I'm just drawing one of them. Okay, you don't need multiple ones for this mechanism to work. But this electron density here is going to be distributed about the entire porphyrin ring system. Okay, And of course, whenever you do that proton transfer, you'll go through the same thing again. The histidine now is going to be deprotonated by some basic residues, and that's going to ultimately pump the proton out of the enzyme and out of the porphyrin ring's way. Okay, So now what we have is we have the fully deprotonated, fully aromatic porphyrin ring system. And then finally what's going to happen is this iron here, which I'll circle in red, this ferrous iron is now going to be incorporated into the center of the porphyrin ring system. So there's kind of like, an, you could think of it as like there's kind of an, a region of electron density in here. okay? And the electron density as a whole kind of is what attacks this iron. okay? So the electron density attacks the iron, and that puts this ferrous iron in the dead center of the porphyrin ring system. And now we have our final product. So we've, we've spent many videos on heme synthesis. So now we have heme B, our final product, and that can be incorporated into enzymes by itself. Okay, As we know, this is a constituent of things like hemoglobin, myoglobin. When we get it into the ferric state, it can be used in cytochrome P450s or nitric oxide synthase. That uses heme B, but if we want to make um, other proteins like cytochrome C, we're going to have to transform this into heme C. Okay? If we want to use something like heme A, which is in cytochrome C oxidase, we're going to have to transform this into heme A. So we're going to have to do some more work in getting those forms of heme. Okay? But this is just going to give us heme B, and you'll also see this written as iron protoporphyrin 9. The derivation of that, of that name comes from the fact that it is protoporphyrin 9 in the completely deprotonated state with an iron chelated in the center. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Okay, so just to do some very quick reviews here. Okay, remember there's an iron sulfur center in here, a two iron, two sulfur center, and its purpose is regulatory. So if there's low iron, you're not going to have an iron sulfur center, and so you're not going to be doing this reaction because you need to conserve the iron for other things. Okay, and so protoporphyrin 9 builds up. That will go back and allosterically inhibit delta amino levulinic acid synthase, thus stalling heme synthesis. Okay, so that's one level of regulation. Also, remember when there's low iron, aconitase or aconitate hydratase, the second enzyme in the TCA cycle, will jettison its iron sulfur center, becoming an iron response protein. And that will downregulate ferritin and upregulate transferrin, thus allowing iron entry into the body and transfer in the blood. And that raises iron levels so that you can make this iron sulfur center and therefore carry out the reaction. And if you have a deficiency of this enzyme, you develop something that's not very good, and that's erythropoietic protoporphyria. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on the final reaction in the synthesis of heme. In later videos, we'll actually look at what you can do from to heme to make the other hemes like heme O, heme A, and heme C. See you in the next video.